The mission of the WPSA is to recruit, retain, and develop women leaders at the Cleveland Clinic. This video will highlight the history of the WPSA and women in clinic history. In the interviews that follow, we will gain insight into the challenges some of our peers have faced and the successes they have celebrated. We look to our colleagues for advice for women who are presently in position of leadership and for advice for future generations of leaders. I was a uh, resident uh, rotating through Cleveland Clinic and on my senior resident year I was offered to come in as staff at the Cleveland Clinic. It was a great honor but it was also very scary because there was no women in the division of surgery. In the clinical arena there probably were no more than three of us that I could identify at that time and perhaps four. There was Harriet Dustin, who was in renal hypertensive and an icon in her field, who got to be president of the staff. There was Kathy Poponiak, who was in her particular apartment, and she was just a busy person and a very good physician. Myself, and then Gita Gidwani came on as the first OBGYN surgeon. In fact, the first woman surgeon outside of ophthalmology, because they had had a woman surgeon to my knowledge. So we are very, very few of us. And some people have asked me, well, why did you start the Women's Professional Society at the Cleveland Clinic? I said, because we didn't have anybody. And we didn't have anybody to talk to. And so we decided there were so few medical women that we'd have to invite the medical interns and residents, but there were a fair number of women in that group, but also the administrators that were women. And there always have been many women administrators because we all were sharing similar issues. And one was lack of friendship, uh, lack of people to eat lunch with or dinner with if you're held over, and also the fact that we had some needs. We wanted to be represented in the committees, at the Board of Governors, at the staff leadership positions, because we were working hard. And we were achieving in our fields outside of the Cleveland Clinic. Soon we figured out that this was a great tool for us, area where we could network, we could talk about our problems, which were, you know, caretaking, elder care, and you know, what do we do with the babies at home, and what, how do we, how do we manage to get away from home, and you know, still be able. So there were little tricks that we all talk, taught each other. Plus, we talked to each other, so it was great. And then Dr. Bernadine Healy arrived, and so of course she was a great role model for all of us. And she was a division chief, so then she, then we started having some formal lectures and people coming and talking to us and, and uh, helping us to see the outside world as we should have been doing right from the beginning. I often look to the women on the staff in pathology and lab medicine for guidance. Um, Dr. Mindy Estes was one of our neuropathologists at the time that I thought was quite a leader. Uh, she had roles at, at that point, I believe, on the Board of Governors, um, and I looked to her you know, as a leader in pathology and lab medicine. Well, I think a lot of us think of mentors as the Wilma Bergfelds and the Susan Reams and the Cindy Dalings and the Holly Thackers who are either at our level or ahead, but I actually started <laughs> looking for advice and, and mentorship just among my peers. I met a number of infectious disease practitioners across the United States who were involved and interested in the same thing. And some of them became my mentors from afar. Uh, one guy in particular, uh, who is in the Washington DC area, uh, nominated me for membership on a professional board on the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases. And I ended up being on that board for more than 20 years on the the medical director for that organization now. But it was not really from the clinic per se that that happened. That was, that was an external mentor. Well, the mentor that means the most to me, uh, both inside and outside the Cleveland Clinic, is Dr. Gita Gitwani. Uh, she's a friend, she's a mentor, she provides sage advice uh, for career development, personal development. She probably has been my therapist at times, um, but she's also, most importantly, a friend. 
and she really early on nurtured my career. Um, despite doing a lot, uh, I thought I was doing a lot, it was she who said, you know, you need to start presenting your data, you need to take uh, meetings, you need to study uh, abroad, uh, you need to, to take uh, advantage of all the things that the Cleveland Clinic allowed in terms of travel and presentation of the things that I consider my platform. Bruce Stewart was your champion. He was like a person who always, when you went there, he would say, now what did you do last year? And you'd say, oh, I did this, this, this. Well, you know, you're going to be the president of that group. And you'd look at him and say, I can't be president. And he'd say, that's how we all started. What do you mean? Of course you will do it. And it was the confidence that he put in you. And Dr. Hartwell was exactly the same. Always a lot of confidence. You will do it, you know. And it was like somebody telling you, I'm your cheerleader. You're going to do it, you know. Know, to get a leadership position, one had to be excellent in clinical medicine, that one had to be excellent in research, you know, the true triple threat, and be excellent in education. And while I think a lot of the leaders I see at the clinic are that mold of people who, you know, have that clinical research and education expertise, I'm not convinced that that is what makes a good leader. I think once you've gotten into a leadership position, I think there are other qualities that you need. Um, and, and whether it's political savvy um, or emotional intelligence or however you want to, to put it, I think being able to understand what people want, to be able to relate to people, to be able to politically uh, discuss and see through situations without irritating a lot of people, uh, to me, is really one of the things that makes a good leader. I think that the traits of a good leader, first of all, uh, and foremost is honesty and integrity, uh, being fair-minded, being imaginative, being intelligent, and being persuasive. It's about honesty, it's about gaining respect, um, which takes you know, months, years um, to really earn, and um, I think those things are important. It's important to be fair, I think, but you need to be firm. You need to make people accountable. If you're a clinician, be a really good clinician. If you're a researcher, get the grants, be out there, do what you do really well. That kind of credibility, I think, is essential to success at the clinic, no matter what you decide to do, whether you want to do your original job full time, or if you want to branch out and do some administrative things, or if you want to grow your individual career in education or, or other directions. You've got to be pretty darn good at what you do in the first place and never lose sight of that. Communication is extremely important. You must be a good communicator and we know that as physicians but you have to be able to communicate to the public and to your peers and you have to be able to communicate in a way that you can change opinion. So you have to learn that skill. And so I thought I'll build these skills and so when the job comes up I'll be right there. And lo and behold that's what happened. <laughs> You don't get successful just because you think you should be successful. There is a great deal of work that you have to do. And preparation, preparation, preparation is where it is. It's not overnight you become a leader or have a leadership responsibility. Um, it takes time. You build that respect. But there are so many women out there who have that opportunity and, and have it in them um, to be great leaders in this organization. If you're not prepared and you don't have the energy and you don't goal set, you're going nowhere. So I would advise any young woman who is entering the field of medicine and coming to the Cleveland Clinic, you can be a yeoman physician here. They need yeoman. But if you want to be a star and you want to be someone who makes a difference, then you must prepare yourself to be a leader. And that skill has to be learned. I look for things I can improve. I don't have to be perfect. I just have to try. And I think if women have a little defeat, maybe they're not selected for a post, or their paper isn't published, whatever that is, you don't give up. You just stand up, you dust off, and you go back again. You need to be good at what you do. You need to be affable, be responsive, and I think take ownership for the choices you make. And as you know, for us women, you know, our career clocks and our uh, biological clocks stick in harmony. And you know, what are you willing to give up and what price are you willing to pay? 
really it it just boils down to that but you know in the long run I think it all will work out and you can't have it all at the same time so I don't think it's so much personality traits I think it is being in line with the mission and if you're in line with the mission and you believe in it enough strongly enough then you will go after that and it will become yours The future of the women here looks bright. Uh, as I always say, when I came here, uh, you know, there was nobody in OBGYN, and right now my entire residency has only one male in a group of 32. So we have the numbers, and we have women that are very bright, and women that want to uh, take the leadership roles. So I think uh, what is important is for the women to be ready to take these leadership roles and groom themselves, but also for the institute to support them because it's very important that they be supported and groomed as they go along. For the next generation of people here, I would hope that they would continue to enjoy patient care. I always feel that that is still the rock that, that keeps me, that's my touchstone that keeps me going. There are a lot of times when I wish there wasn't quite as much of it, but it is still the foundation, and, and I would encourage people to try to find ways that they can maintain their joy in what it is they do every day. I would also urge people to be flexible. Be flexible and value flexibility. That will only help in the long run. If nothing else, it'll help you keep your sanity. Have fun, to smile and laugh and cry together, and to also help one another. So I really do think the recruiting of women is very key in this era. The retention of women, once they're here, how can we make their lives better to promote uh, in order for them to stay? And then last, promoting them to the next levels of leadership, whether it's through the medical school, whether it's in a department, whether it's on committees. And I think all of those kinds of things are quite important. Cleveland Clinic has been a platform. And it, it's been my ambition to be here. It has, been, it has fulfilled me and it has allowed me to go on to be a better physician. And I'm very, very grateful. But there have been wars here, and there have been situations that were uncomfortable that the young women do not have today. And I'm really happy that they don't. But you, I can't leave you without saying, even with the controversy, it still was a lot of fun and a lot of challenge. And I'm certainly glad I've been here, and I'm certainly glad my career has been here.